Great. Um, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Eric. Thank you to the IOM for bringing all of us together. And I also heard the comments this morning and look forward to a lively, uh, lively discussion. Um, so uh, what I want to do is present on work that was significantly developed by this um, team. Um, my lovely colleague Ruth Faden and I got one of these ARA uh, challenge grants to take on some of these issues um, in ethics of a learning healthcare system, although at the beginning of the project that's not what we called it, but by evolution it's what it turned into. Um, the other core members of the team, um, I imagine many of you recognize, or at least some of them, Tom Beecham is a philosopher at Georgetown and importantly is one of the drafters of the Belmont Report. And again, some of the evolution of his thinking I think is important in, in context. Sean Tunis runs the Center for Medical Technology Policy, an expert in comparative effectiveness. Peter Pronovost, many of you know, an expert in patient safety and quality. And Steve Goodman, an expert in clinical trials now at Stanford. Okay, so what I want to do um, is take us through what I am going to propose maybe could be an evolution in the way we think about ethics and human research from what I want to frame as a distinctions paradigm um, where ethics and oversight are based on a definition, Barbara started to introduce that, um, of research and everything that fits that definition gets a fair amount of oversight and regulation and everything that doesn't fit the definition doesn't get that kind of prospective oversight. So that's what I'm going to call the distinctions paradigm to maybe a different kind of model um, in this sort of integrated care and uh, research together where ethics oversight is based on whether there are moral concerns that would be uh, deduced through a variety of considerations. So I want to walk you through the distinctions paradigm, and then I'll move to model two, which is where maybe we'll have even more of a lively debate. So um, in case anybody needs this background, in the 60s and 70s, the public became aware of a lot of research ethics problems in the United mm -hmm. States, most notably the Tuskegee syphilis study. That led to our Congress to say we need laws on this for the first time, and federal regulations were uh, passed. Given the context out of which they emerged, there's a very strong emphasis appropriately on protection Actions, um, and IRB review is required for any kind of human research that meets those uh, criteria that Barbara um, outlined, and informed consent is required for most of that human research. So these regulations, like any other regulations, rely on being able to define and identify the activities to which those regulations apply. And because, again, uh, anything that met that, met that regulatory definition of research needed all that oversight, and anything that didn't, i.e. clinical care, did not. So um, what I have on this slide are five criteria, the first two outlined by Barbara, that are um, outlined, the first two in the regulations to help define research that needs ethical oversight, and the next three um, themes that recur pretty frequently in the literature as being morally relevant criteria that the literature argues um, distinguish research from clinical care that help to justify why research needs this ethical, um, this additional ethical oversight that clinical care doesn't get in a prospective way. So this is going to be sort of relevant to our setup, and I want to go through these um, briefly. So again, as Barbara outlined, the, the regulations themselves um, put forward what what we ha what I have here as the two key pieces of the definition that that Barbara uh, read to you. Research involves I'm going to do these in reverse order systematic data collection and if you think back to the 1970s when the regulations were passed we didn't have electronic medical records I think the what was juxtaposed was that research collects data systematically, aggregates it, analyzes it systematically. And clinical care is where the data we collect is for one patient in one chart to be used by a small group of providers, and that's a way that we can help to distinguish, aha, those things look like research. And then when we collect those data systematically, um, we use them to generalize the information we learn for the care of other people, right? So what is implied through the definition is that what is not there, what is practice instead, again, is more individualized data collection to be used to improve care for the patients in front of us. Um, 
So then in taking that further, the literature goes into why all that becomes ethically relevant and throws in a few additional criteria. So one of the things we did in our project, thanks to a lot of research assistants, um, was really come the literature for how and why people have, been, have distinguished research from practice in ways that they claim are ethically relevant. So one claim in the literature is that research has more risks and uncertainties than clinical care, and that's a reason why we need to protect people. And again, logically, that makes a lot of sense. What I'm not going to rehearse in this crowd, but some of it came up this morning in Brent James' presentation and a lot of others, is that actually when you start to look at the data, um, there's a remarkable amount of uncertainty um, and risk uh, and unproven care um, that happens in clinical uh, delivery as well. But it's a claim in the literature. Another claim in the literature is that research poses additional burdens on the patients or participants who take part for example, when we invite them in to do extra visits, ask them to do extra tests simply for the sake of the research or the learning, and the implication is that in clinical care, every time we ask someone to undergo a test or a visit or give them a drug or anything else, it is for their um, well-being, right? So again, we can see where this logical paradigm is so logical. It just turns out that when you look at the data, it doesn't turn out to be true. Um, and then in research, is the, the last claim that we found uh, pretty consistently in the literature that, again, I hope for obvious reasons, has a lot of ethical import, um, were it to be true, um, is that protocols help define what kind of care you get in research. But in clinical care, it's through the thoughtful, considered discussions um, that you have with your physician or your physician's considered um, wisdom. Um, and uh, that is something that patients ought to know, and that's one of the reasons we have to get informed consent. Again, in real life, we know that um, there are a lot of things that go into clinical decision making, into, including a lot of protocols now that determined either through your healthcare delivery system or your payer how often you can get a test, what kinds of drugs you'll be given, whether you get generics, et cetera, et cetera. And we also know that um, particularly in comparative effectiveness designs, research these days often has a lot more flexibility than what was traditionally thought. But these are the five um, definitions or claims that are made in the literature that help to, that have helped build this narrative for 40 years, that this is why things called research need all this ethical uh, protection. So one of the claims we made through our work is that there are problems with this distinction and problems with basing, again, what gets ethical oversight and what doesn't on this set of, um, of assumptions. And we would argue that there are practical and conceptual or definitional and, most importantly, moral problems with this. So the practical problems, I think a few people were also saying, it's not only the delays, it's that so many IRBs don't know what to do, right? So Barbara gave that example of the QI project. Um, certainly at my institution, I'm not going to rehearse it, but some of you know what my dear colleague Peter Pronovos went through with his Michigan checklist study. Um, all of his research was shut down because the IRB thought one thing and OHRP thought another, and then a year later, OHR OHRP reversed what it said and said, well, actually, the Hopkins IRB was right. But nobody wants to go through that. Um, and this is with an IRB that is very experienced, and Peter being very conscientious in outlying, um, outlining everything and calling it uh, research. So if experienced people look at the regs and don't know what to do with them, then there's a practical problem. Conceptual problem, I'm not going to rehearse. It's what I was going through on the last slide. But if we say, here's research and here's not, and then Actually, the definitions don't work because there aren't more risks or we collect data just as systematically in clinical care. Quality improvement is designed inherently to improve care, to generalize what you learn through QI for the future patients in your hospital or your system. So the definitions start to fall apart. And then importantly, this entire apparatus that everybody knew would cause hurdles and delays was justified because of what I'll take to be a shared commitment to the fact that, of course, we must protect patients' interests. But if it turns out we're sort of looking for, um, you know, under the light in the wrong place, that um, we end up overprotecting certain kinds of activities, including many, many low-risk activities. And underprotecting, I think it was, again, part of the argument that was made this morning, we, we um, put a lot of hurdles in the way of learning that theoretically ought to be able to proceed more quickly, and we end up having millions of patients who don't get as high a quality of care as theoretically they ought to. So um, moving forward, I'm going to take two assumptions and then um, take us sort of into what I'll call paradigm two with maybe a, a different kind of, of ethical framework. Um, moral assumption, uh, assumption one is that integrating learning into healthcare is an ethical good. 
Um, it's a good thing to increase the quality, value, fairness, and efficiency of healthcare of systems and of institutions. And then again, what I will say obviously, but I'm going to say it out loud, is that any learning that takes place, and I'm going to use learning broadly, and I agree with the, I think uh, maybe it was uh, Susan said this morning, um, we, need, we need maybe better words for that. Um, uh, but uh, learning must take place um, in an ethical way, and we always must be thoughtful about what kinds of activities are compromising patients' rights and interests, and what kinds aren't, and what kinds of safeguards can we build in in addition to um, informed consent that help really make an impact on um, patients' rights and interests. So one of the final products of this um, project that the six of us did was putting together this ethical framework um, with seven obligations in it. I'm going to go through them. Um, and then a little bit of the thinking we've done since then, and it's really my last slide or two, is um, starting to move toward what would this mean operationally. So um, the first sets of obligations of these seven will look really familiar to you, but we tried to add a few things that we hoped were relevant for this context. So the first is there is always an ethical duty to um, respect patients. And again, that is central to traditional Belmont Report IRB um, considerations and is central these days in clinical care as well. Part of the point we want to make, however, is that not every decision that happens in the healthcare context has equal moral relevance to patients. And it's easy to think of paradigmatic examples, um, but just to throw things out, and particularly because Susan's going to give one of the next um, examples, presumably we would all agree that it's of much greater moral importance to me to be involved in a decision about whether I get back surgery or physical therapy for my back pain than it is for me to think about what kind of um, bathing or hand sanitizer my hospital system is using. And um, to not treat all projects as monolithic in terms of the stake that patients have in being involved in decisions is probably also relevant um, to respect. The second point under respect is that duties of respect traditionally for the last 40 years have been lumped entirely or almost entirely in informed consent. I sort of find myself saying increasingly, we put all of our respect eggs in the basket of informed consent. And I don't mean to minimize the importance of informed consent. When it's called for, it is centrally important, and we have a long way to go in improving the quality and ways in which we do informed consent. But nonetheless, there are so many additional ways in which we can demonstrate respect to patients, and we have to go back to that, and I have a slide on that at the end. We also have an obligation to respect cl clinical judgment. And again, this is, I think, part of what Brent James was talking about where he says, where he said something like it would be nice to automate 90% so you can really think about the 10%. There are reasons we go to doctors and not automatrons. Um, and so that is important in thinking about all this and thinking about what a learning activity or research activity, whatever you want to call it, would do to the ability of clinicians to make the judgments that they think are wise. At the same time, obviously, this has to be put in the context of the tension that exists with honoring the obligation and also recognizing from so much data that um, clinicians' advice can be biased, can be conflicted, and can be um, not fully informed. We always have a duty to provide patients with the best available care. Um, and our view is that in looking at a learning activity, a research activity, it's important to evaluate what would the impact on the quality of their care be as best we can evaluate that compared to the care they would have received had they not been part of the learning activity. Obligation four is um, avoid imposing large additional burdens on patients, right? So again, the metric is what kinds of burdens are we asking patients to undergo if the system or a doctor or a clinic or a hospital participates in some kind of learning activity research project compared to the burdens that patient would have undergone had she not been part of the research activity. Um, this one is a little bit more out there, and um, we might or might not end up talking about it today, but this is a little bit more at the meta level as you start to identify the agenda that a system would um, take on, um, to be mindful that um, there is some duty that at least some of those be thinking about the um, injustices that happen in healthcare and in healthcare outcomes, and use that to help drive some of the agenda in our research and learning activities.
The last two really speak to this um, ethical obligation to conduct learning. And obligation six puts that ethical obligation on the professional side, and obligation seven puts that obligation on the patient side, with boundaries and limits to the extent of the obligation, but still puts those obligations out there. So obligation six says that healthcare professionals, healthcare institutions, and payers all have an ethical responsibility to conduct and contribute to learning. Part of it is that they're uniquely situated. They're the ones that house all the data. They have a lot of expertise. Um, and they should be motivated, particularly if we live in a world that is good, by thinking about things like quality, fairness, um, and economic viability of the healthcare system. Obligation seven is, I will say, in the feedback we've gotten since we published this um, about a year ago, the one that I will say is most controversial and to some degree I will say most frequently misunderstood. So I want to just spend a minute talking about how we meant it. Um, I will stand by what I really believe, which is that I uh, think patients have an obligation to contribute to learning. I was saying to somebody at the break, I do think that there are certain kinds of activities where patients ought not be given a choice. That doesn't mean they ought not be informed. But right now, hospitals don't give patients a choice about quality improvement. And somehow it seems like nobody's raised a ruckus about that. And I would say this goes exactly the same way. There are certain kinds of activities that in no way change the risk, no way change the care, and no way change the burden for patients, where we could learn things that could make a difference in improving care. And I'll put out there that I think in order for patients then to benefit from receiving good care, we need to explain in much better ways than we have that this is all part of the cycle that helps provide them with high quality care. It's derived from this moral norm of common purpose. It's led us sometimes to call this framework a common purpose framework. Um, but it goes with an assumption that patients have an interest in having a high quality health care uh, system in knowing whether they're the kind of person who's going to benefit more from surgery versus physical therapy or from what kind of bathing will help prevent uh, more infections. It does not mean, and this is the part I must underscore, that our group in any way thinks that patients must participate in all learning activities or that we want to throw informed consent out the window for all kinds of projects. But we do start with an assumption that for certain kinds of activities, exactly the way we've felt so comfortable with QI, um, patients have a responsibility to be part of this system. The more that an activity starts to impact on obligations one through four, on things like risks or burdens or um, the kinds of interests that patients genuinely would have and what kind of care they receive, even if they're both standard, then of course patients must be given a choice in that. Um, but when obligations one through four are impacted little, if at all, then we would argue there is some obligation to be part of it. So now I'm going to sort of go beyond what we published a year ago and just have, I think I only have two slides left that speak to implementation. What would this be like in the real world? Um, in our at least uh, nascent thinking about this, there would be maybe uh, two pieces on this, and I'm sure there are more. The first is there would be policies in place that apply to everything, that apply to all of the ongoing learning in a healthcare system. And if you think, and again, there's so many people here who live this and exemplify it and have been the leaders in it, if you think of systems that really are integrating learning into the delivery of care, there would be, at very least, what we're calling transparency, engagement, and accountability about that ongoing learning. So the transparency is figuring out lots of ways to let patients know, we're a system, we do this, we believe in it, we think it leads to better quality care. There was something that I think came from group health in our background materials that I loved that had the little that had the picture of the person on the bicycle helmet and it's a way of being transparent of saying this is what we do this is what we've learned this is why we do it it's both explicitly and implicitly describing that um, it also we have a lot more detail in in some other things we've written about the various ways that one could try to be transparent engagement getting patients involved, not only in setting some of the agenda, but in the review, in saying, okay, in the bike helmet project, do we need consent? In the record aggregation project, do we need consent? Getting a lot of patients at the table for being involved in um, some of the ethics relevant uh, decisions. And accountability, and again, a few people mentioned this this morning, but to me, the ethics of this entire thing rests on the fact that the quality really will improve. And I guess I can say out loud, I don't come from a system that is highly, where there's highly integrated 
care, and learning. And at my health system, at Johns Hopkins, um, this is, I guess, being webcast, I should be careful what I say, but it's, but it's not, um, I, I don't think anyone would argue that it is typical when one of our academic faculty publishes a research study, that it is likely going to be turned into a change in care. I always joke that the best chance if I go to a Hopkins doctor of um, having the care improved as a result of research, research is if my doctor read that article in the journal. And yet, there, the more the systems start to make these commitments to patients, and the more they say, to some degree, there are certain things that we're just asking you to be part of automatically, because your care will improve, the care has to improve. And there has to be more of this communication and part of the brochures that say, we now send a health visitor to your home uh, in the week after you've had a baby because we learned through a project last year that it really makes a difference. We now have somebody call you for the first month, um, once, once a week after you've been diagnosed with asthma because we've learned through a project. So those kinds of accountability and communication about it are part of the ethics equation. Um, and then there does have to be some kind of real hard decision making about what kinds of projects need to have what kind of oversight. And this is my last slide. Um, this is, again, real um, trial balloon. Uh, hasn't been tested, but it's the beginning of thinking. We're say, saying maybe, maybe research learning activities could be lumped into three buckets. Bucket one would be things that maybe, well, I should, I, would include maybe things like record review, some systems level um, interventions, some prospective observational that doesn't change care, um, where if you really could define it in advance, you maybe could say for projects that meet these kinds of criteria and have the following list of protections in place related to privacy and confidentiality and transparency and other things, maybe they could go forward without prospective oversight and review each time and without consent. Presumably you would have quality control me mechanisms, mechanisms built in like random audits to make sure that the projects really did fit those criteria and the fit promises they made in terms of protections really were in place. Category two would be what maybe we'd call low risk and low burden projects, but where you'd want to make sure there was, there was prospective oversight um, uh, in advance. Maybe there would be comparison of very similar um, treatments to blood pressure medicines to each other, um, where you might think that patients wouldn't have much reason to prefer one or the other, but you want to have the project reviewed um, in advance. Um, and in that context, there might be some context, depending on the patient involvement and transparency, where you even could justify no consent. But certainly, I think you could justify it a very straightforward, streamlined uh, consent that was more akin to the length that happens in clinical care. And then category three is, I guess what I'll say is shorthand, more like traditional old research. And it could be a comparative effectiveness study, but it would more be like the back surgery to the physical therapy, where you not only need prospective review, but of course you want to talk to patients about it. Again, it has a meaningful relevance for patients and their lives. So I think with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you to Claudia and Barbara for allowing me a little um, extra time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Nancy.